Welcome to Artist Decoded. This is your host, Yoshino, and you're listening to the final episode of 2020. Thank you all for tuning in. This is a very special Mindwave episode with Mark Hennick, who is a mental health advocate and speaker. He is most known for his TEDx talk entitled, Why We Need to Talk About Suicide. I'll be providing a link to the TEDx talk on our website, artistdecoded.com, if you want to watch his compelling speech. And on January 12th, he's coming out with a new book he wrote called So-Called Normal. And let me read you a bit about what the book is about. When Mark Hennick was a teenager in Cape Brenton, Nova Scotia, he was overwhelmed by depression and anxiety that led to a series of of increasingly dangerous suicide attempts. One night, he climbed onto a bridge over an overpass and stood in the wind. Clinging to a girder, someone shouted, Jump, you coward! Another man, a stranger in a brown coat, talked to him quietly, calmly, and with deep empathy. Just as Hennick's feet touched open air, the man in the brown coat encircled his chest, and pulled him to safety. This near-death experience changed Hennick's life forever. So-Called Normal is Hennick's memoir about growing up in a broken home and the events that led to that fateful night on the bridge. It is a vivid and personal account of the mental health challenges he experienced in childhood and his subsequent journey toward healing and recovery. Mark also desires to break the stigma that prevents people from speaking openly about their mental health. He believes that freedom is found in overcoming the barriers that stigma, disempowerment, and disconnection build. He also has a very interesting podcast where he interviews various people that have personally gone through mental health issues from experts in the field to celebrities that are advocates for mental health awareness, such as Rosie O'Donnell and Glenn Close, but he also talks to other people who have gone through mental health issues, and he opens up a space for them to speak openly about what they've gone through, which I really personally enjoyed listening to. And this conversation that I had with him is really great. I'll continue to listen to his podcast as well. It's also called So-Called Normal. If you're curious and you want to go check it out, you can listen to it on all podcast apps. I also thought that Mark's thoughts about the destigmatization of mental health issues and suicide is a very important subject to talk about, especially coming out of a year that has been challenging, to say the least. And I hope everyone can find some catharsis with this episode. I know I have from a personal standpoint, But I'm very glad that I'm able to share this with all of you, and hopefully we will all have a good start to 2021, and let's dive in. So without further ado, here's my conversation with mental health advocate and speaker, Mark Hennick. Hope you enjoy it. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us on Artist Decoded. I really appreciate it. I'm really happy to be here. It's been such a an exciting journey for me to finally share uh, the book that's been bouncing around in my head for the last four years. Now people are finally starting to read it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and just like the, the work that you do in general for mental wellness and also bringing awareness to mental health, I think is super, super important. And the more that I dive into the work that you do, the more that I appreciate the amount of time that you put into it and also the care and your podcast, for instance, is it's really interesting. I like it a lot. And I think that you bring in, you know, people that have are just like regular people. And then you mm-hmm. contrast that with people that are specialists within their field that work with helping people that are suffering from mental health issues. And I think being able to destigmatize that is super important and yeah, just the work you do is, mm. is 
is, is good. It's really well, thank good. you. And, and, you know, I really firmly believe that the way that we break down stigma is not always by hearing about experts talking about what's wrong with you. I mean, that's a, that's a small piece of it, I think, is that it's important to have that expert view of the signs and the symptoms and the, and the types of medical treatments that you need. I know, you know, that was part of what helped me in my own recovery, but I think it's, also important to hear uh, diverse voices about mental health and how this impacts everybody from, you know, whether I'm, I'm sitting at Glenn Close's kitchen table or Rosie O'Donnell's art room in, in her condo in Manhattan, or just some random per person that you've never heard of, or a researcher or a writer. Um, it's not enough to say that mental health impacts everybody. We know that everybody has mental health and, and some people uh, experience mental illnesses too. But what does that actually look like, you know, beyond a textbook? How does it really impact people? That's what I'm fascinated by. Hmm. Definitely. And can you talk a bit about your personal experiences with dealing with mental health issues? I mean, I, you know, I was uh, watching your TED talk and then also just diving more into your story about how there was a certain point in your life where you're standing on a, a bridge. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I first started experiencing symptoms of what I now know anyway was uh, depression and anxiety as young as about 10 years old. Um, I first started becoming suicidal and thinking about suicide uh, when I was 12. And, you know, between the ages of 12 and 17 or so, it was a, a really rough time for me, not only at home and I think some of the, the social determinants of my mental health, uh, but within my own mind and within my own brain. And, and the story that you're referencing is one of the two that I tell in a TED talk, which ended up going viral around the world, in which, you know, I was at the end of my line. I, I felt like I, well, by that point, I had been in and out of hospital more than half a dozen times. And I felt unhelpable. Like if all these very extremely smart people and doctors and experts uh, couldn't figure out why I wanted to kill myself so badly, uh, why I was so depressed and so anxious, uh, then it, maybe it just meant that I was one of the unfortunate few uh, for whom there'd never be an answer, that, that this would always be my burden. Uh, so I went to a bridge in my hometown. I climbed up over the railing. It was late at night on a on a Sunday night in March, almost 20 years ago now, actually. And I fully intended to die. And if it wasn't for a complete stranger who stopped his car, he got out, he, he came out over and talked to me. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be alive to share these stories today. Yeah. And I love the vulnerability that you, I mean, how vulnerable you are. You know, you. I was watching a YouTube video of you opening up the letter from that person that, that saved you. Yeah. And, you know, and, and you're also talking about just how this person wasn't trying to just fix you. This yeah. person was actually trying to genuinely listen to you and, you know, try to hear you out and just be present with you. And I just think of the importance of that, just that presence and, and also just being present with ourselves. But yeah, I think, you know, you being able to put that out there and, and be vulnerable with yourself and to put that out there to the world to see, I think is, is very powerful. And I think a lot of people, especially from the world that we live in, trying to destigmatize this sort of these gender roles mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important to show that. Well, as well. And that actually came out as a, a recurring theme in my book. And I guess it had always been, the gender roles idea and, and particularly the, the um, concept of toxic masculinity, I'd always been surrounded by it. But for some reason, I didn't realize that in fully the, the way until I actually took a step back and was writing the book and realized, holy, I, no wonder uh, I was so afraid to share my emotions. I didn't think it'd be okay. I didn't think it was normal or, or acceptable for uh, young boys or men to share what they were feeling. And really the cumulative effect on me was that if you don't share your feelings, they don't go away and they come out in other ways. And for me, they compounded and started to come out as depression and anxiety and ultimately as, as suicidality. So you're right. When, when I shared that, um, letter uh, from the man who saved my life on the bridge that night. I mean, I had climbed up over the railing and he talked to me and I knew that he wasn't an expert. I knew he wasn't a doctor because I could tell by the sound of his voice. I had talked to so many. He didn't sound like one. He was just talking to me about, you know, I think he asked me about my, my pets, about my cat, <laughs> about my interests and hobbies and subjects that I liked in school and my family. Like it was all stuff that I think maybe well-intentioned healthcare providers just didn't think to to talk about that, hey, why don't we just treat him like a normal person and get to know him? And maybe that'll help to unlock some of this isolation and loneliness and, and fear that he's constantly feeling. They just didn't think of that because that's not their 
their area, I guess. Mm -hmm. But when he did that for me, I think it that ended up being my last suicide attempt or my last ho hospitalization for suicide as well because of that kind of connection that he built with me. And, and it took me more than a decade, actually, uh, 12 or 13 years to find him. I didn't know that he was, I didn't know who he was on the bridge because I couldn't see him and he left and there was no record of him. Uh, and I guess I just went on with my life until I did the TEDx talk and uh, I told that story about him and suddenly he's famous around the world too and nobody else knows who he is either. So I, I decided, you know what, I got to find this guy because I don't even, my, I mean, my secret was I didn't even know if he was real. I didn't know if I had just made him up as a way to make my own story make sense or what. But anyway, I went, I went on uh, national television here in Canada and I asked for the public's help in finding this guy because I had no records of him in my medical records or the police records or anything like that. And much to my surprise, within like an hour or two, I started getting messages from people all over the world. The story goes viral all around the world of me trying to find this stranger in the light brown jacket, because that's all that I could see at the time was that he was wearing a light brown jacket and I had no other information about him. And it turns out mm -hmm. some people who saw the the posts on social media on my Twitter and Facebook pages and some people who saw the television segment that was ended up ended up getting broadcast all over the world, uh, they reached out to me and said that they knew who I was talking about and one guy said he was his roommate at the time. He came home and told him about everything that had happened. And somebody else said he was his brother-in-law. And it turns out the the stranger by that point had seen my TED Talk just a week before I went on national television to look for him. And he had already written me a letter just a week before uh, in case someday he ever found me. Uh, so when they he sent me the letter, I recorded myself reading it, and that's the video you're referring to. So if any of your listeners uh, want to see a video of a guy really ugly crying on uh, on the internet, you can look up that video. <laughs> um, because I figured, you know, I I invited the public into the beginning of this. I might as well invite them into the rest of it. So you know, I read that letter. He introduced himself. His name is Mike, and all at once it hit me: this this guy is real, and if he's real. It meant that my story was real too, and it was just so incredibly validating. Yeah, can you talk about the just being vulnerable, and I mean, you being able to share your story, and that I guess you know all of these experiences that have accumulated for you to want to be able to share that, and maybe that time when it clicked, it's like, oh, this is what I'm actually meant to do is to be able to be a conduit, essentially, mm -hmm. for people to learn more about mental health and also to learn more about themselves and to be honest with themselves? Yeah, you know, I, I think that for me, my um, advocacy and, and uh, media work that I've done in mental health has always been tied very, very closely to my own recovery. Um, you know, after I left hospital that last time, still not knowing who Mike was, I went, I remember going to my high school principal and having the realization that everybody I felt like knew what I'd been struggling with anyway. I mean, I grew up in a small town. Anytime you try to try to attempt suicide, uh, the police get called uh, very often and everybody in a small town listen to the police scanner <laughs> to see if there's any chatter over their radios and if there's anybody they could talk about because they probably knew them anyway. So I felt like our, everybody already knew my story and were talking about me behind my back. So why don't I just own my own story? Why don't I tell my side of it? And that was really kind of the motivation for me. I, feel, I kind of felt like I had nothing left to lose. So they think of me differently. That didn't really cross my mind because I was already kind of the crazy kid, I thought. So what's the difference if they think of me differently? I can't get any lower. Um, so I went to my high school principal, I asked if I could speak openly with my peers in, in high school about suicide and uh, uh, mental health problems and illnesses. And his immediate response was no, <laughs> that no, you can't talk about suicide, because if you talk about it, it gives people the idea to go out and do it as though I when I went to the bridge that night, I had never thought of it before. Somebody said to me, hey, have you thought about trying to kill yourself? And I thought, no, that's a good idea. Why don't I go do that? That's not how it happened. It, it came from a result of years of struggle, of symptoms of mental illness of trauma and abuse it wasn't nobody gave me the idea to kill myself but lots of people gave me the idea not to talk about it so i think that's that was the earliest point that i can re remember becoming a mental health advocate a mental health activist antagonist maybe uh, because when he told me that i couldn't do it that's what lit the fire under me to do it anyway um, so i went home and i wrote a, my very first letter to the editor of our local newspaper i disclosed all of my personal experiences and my interactions with the healthcare system and how how terrible they often were uh, i think i likened my high school administration to communist russia for stifling my free speech <laughs> <laughs> um, and the next day there were television news cameras at the school asking why it wasn't okay to talk about mental health. So I, I think that's when 
that was the moment that an advocate was born. And it showed me that I could do something with my struggle, that my struggle could be my strength. It could be my purpose. And over the, the next uh, many years, I built that up to be the case. Hmm. Okay, so I've I've never really dissected this with anyone of a professional nature such as yourself, but I have this personal theory of non-compartmentalization. Mm. What do you mean? So essentially, the way that I've been thinking about it is being able to self-actualize and realize a lot of inherent truths within yourself and to be able to embody that and dissect that and then spit that out and turn that into different areas mm -hmm. within your life. So for instance, me as an artist, there are certain things that I would need to do commercially because you know I, I have a background as a photographer and I would shoot commercially, but it, I would compartmentalize mm -hmm. essentially my art practice, my personal art practice and things that I was really, that were mm -hmm. true to me and indicative of me and things that I would need to shoot for like clients mm -hmm. and things like that. And that's just kind of one microcosm, right? But then since then, and since starting this podcast, I've been on this journey essentially to what I consider non-compartmentalization, mm. which I feel is more so about an honesty and an openness to create a reality that is the truest form yeah, of yourself. That, that's something that's all of you, I think. Not not you don't have to put on different hats and and you know i, I feel this um, strongly because i think everybody goes through this at some point and in some ways i wonder if it's part of just getting older you know you and i aren't that old yet or at least we like to keep telling ourselves i'm sure but i think it is um, <laughs> yeah. you know I, yeah. i'm an i'm an amateur uh, wine lover and i'm i'm practicing as much as i can to get better but why i raise that is because uh, <laughs> Yeah, you and I both. as wines mature, when they're very, very young, they you get the the strong individual notes of all the different fruitiness or tannins or all the individual pieces are all very strong. But then as they get older, they mellow out and they blend together. And that compartmentalization that you're talking about becomes less definite. Everything kind of sings together, uh, finds more harmony. And I think that's very much what happens with people, too. It's kind of a cliche to say aging like a fine wine, I know. But but it's very much the case. And, and those boundaries inside yeah. you start to dissolve. And, you know, I, yeah. I think from a theoretical perspective that it's probably a, an artifact or a remnant of adolescence where out of necessity, when you're a teenager, you try on different identities. You're supposed to, you're figuring out who you are and um, you, you fall into different cliques and have different passions. That's great. That's normal. Um, and then later on in life, I think as you get a little bit older, all those silos still exist inside you of all your separate interests. Uh, but then the walls start to come down and you start to realize who you actually are. You know, you're the sum total of everything you've ever experienced. And I think that's where our true uniqueness comes in, that nobody has had the exact same combination of experiences as you. Um, we all have our common humanity, of course, but we're each our own individual iteration of that. And I, I think that's where the artistry, I think, of humanity comes in. And that's what makes it so incredibly beautiful to see how people aggregate their experiences into, into something special. Yeah. And I think the more that you can be honest with that and the more that you can actually try to find the confluence of all of these disparate elements and blend them in together. That is something, I mean, that's essentially mm -hmm. poetry, right? Poetry of life. And I, I feel that your life could be its own specific art form. So I find it interesting for you, for instance, you going through all these life experiences and then finding the silver lining of some of this trauma that you've dealt with and being able to investigate it, talk to different professionals, write a book about it, you know, do the Ted talk and, what, what do you think is something that makes you want to keep on doing this mental health work and then to be able to talk about it in an open, an honest way? You know, one one part of it for me is that I have no other transferable skills. This is, I do, this is all I know how to do. So um, but <laughs> I think the other part of it uh, is that it's it's an endless source of, of interest for me. You know, early on, much of what I did, and, and I've said this before, is was entirely selfish. You know, I went to um, I went off to university. I was the first in my family to go to, to, to undergrad. And I did that as a challenge. You know, my sister had said to me at one point, you don't really think you're ever going to get out of this place. Or our, our little hometown. I said, you bet I am. Uh, and then to go off to grad school, I studied developmental psychology. 
not because I wanted to understand how other kids developed, but I wanted to understand what the hell happened to me. <laughs> I was trying to figure myself out. And then even the advocacy in some ways, too, it's endlessly interesting for me because it's such a, a diverse range of, of experiences and there's so much depth there. I, I can't possibly imagine moving through the world in, in such an unexamined way where you're just working your nine to five job. And, and I mean, this is great for some people, but it's not for me working your nine to five job. And then you just unplug at the end of the day and there's nothing interesting for me and nothing interesting happening. That would be my worst nightmare. But my chosen career, once I decided to fully go into it, and that wasn't always the case for me. Um, uh, it was really ultimately when I got the book deal in 2017 that I finally said, you know, I'd been climbing the corporate ladder within the traditional structures and never feeling like I fully fit in those structures. I decided to take the leap and leave that work and go fully into my advocacy and uh, and book writing with my whole self. And, you know, the first year was was hard and I knew it was going to be. But then after that, you know, it, it it I'm so glad that I'm doing it. Even the hard days are better than some of the best days uh, in a in a suit that didn't fit me. You know, so I think that everybody has their own journey in that respect. And that for me is what gives me the energy to keep doing it is that if I get bored with one small part of what I'm doing, I switch to something else. And that's why, you know, my podcast is kind of a mishmash of different stories, too, because my challenge to myself going into that was you tell me any subject, any topic, any person, and I will find the mental health angle of it. Um, because there's always an angle that relates to our emotional health and well-being, our cognitive health and well-being, our physiological, and it's all tied together. So um, I think find what you're most passionate about. No, let me correct that. Build what you're most, most passionate about, because I think it only starts as really seeds of interest. Uh, and then passion isn't found on the side of the road as though somebody had discarded it or lost it or, or magically appears. Passion is something that you cultivate. Uh, and if you, if you feel strongly about something, take the risk. If it doesn't work out, fine. You take a different risk. <laughs> that's, that's the way that I've, um, uh, that's where I've landed on why I keep doing this. Yeah. And I think that's a healthy way to go about things too, is that if you're thinking about things, I mean, it's interesting that you say build the thing that you're most passionate about, because I think about that too, in terms of, um, I kind of think about just life is in terms of building blocks and essentially, you know, and I like to use a metaphor of, you know, building blocks as a child, because I think a lot of the times, doing things that are innate within us. It comes mm -hmm. from that childlike mm -hmm. spirit as well. And I think that there are times in this life where we might lie to ourselves or not be completely honest with ourselves about things and then, you know, form these secondhand values from other people's insecurities about what we should do with our lives and, you know, how we need to get this certain like nine to five career or, or those sort of things. But then again, it's like, what is, what yeah. do we want? You know? And I think like, do, I'm curious with this sort of like self reflectiveness that we're talking about too. Do you think that the essentially phoning it in and not being self reflective is like in your findings, is that like a big cause of people's depression and anxiety? I think it's a fair, it's a fair, it's a fair uh, assumption. And I think that might be the case in some ways, um, because there's reasons why. And, and, and well, let me, let me kind of play with this a little bit. I, I think that the reasons why people go into that kind of career, and I've felt this, I have felt this desire very strongly to, you know, want to just show up for work, do the job that's asked of you, and then go home and have a separate life. Because it can be kind of exhausting to always, it, vocations can be exhausting because it's always who you are, right? Um, especially early on. But I think the reason why we take flight uh, into the into those um, types of structures is because it's safe. It's safer to be in that kind of structure. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to expose yourself in a real way. Like if you're in this kind of work as a freelancer or or uh, building your passion or whatever it is, you're exposing your true self. And th look, the reality is it might not work out. <laughs> you might fail. You might go broke. You, your ideas might have already been done by somebody else. There's all kinds of circumstances. You might have a great, amazing pitch that you think would be uh, 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 spectacular for everybody. And then it doesn't even get answered uh, by the people that you really want to answer that pitch. That's just the reality of the world out there. And I think that people are afraid 
to pursue that and to embrace that wholeheartedly because if you open yourself up and it's personal when you're when that gets rejected then they're rejecting you as a person and i don't think everybody is is I don't think most people are there yet where they're in a place where they can take that kind of rejection. But, you know, that's what I think resilience is. Resilience is about how you rest, recharge, and then repeat, do it again, right? It's it's not about avoiding struggle. It's not about avoiding, yeah. or it's not about only good vibes and uh, all this positive, that's toxic positivity, right? Um, <laughs> resilience is about how you fail yeah, yeah. And, and then bounce back again. And that needs to be practiced. Yeah, no, I like I like that you brought that up because I was listening to your podcast and you're talking mm. about having grit and how that is super important, especially when it comes to well, multiple areas of your life, but um, yeah. also with mental health too. And I think it's good to understand cognitively that just like muscles and building muscle, these things are built over time. They are. Well, and you gotta be, I think you have to be kind of scrappy. And this is, I've learned to love my, my, um, some of the more difficult parts of my life because I always look to what, what have been the lessons that I have drawn from this, either intentionally uh, or just accidentally. What did, what, what did these things leave with me? And I think that grittiness comes from just growing up on the wrong side of the tracks. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the number of times I've said to myself, Oh God, why did I send that email? Or why did I say that? Or why did I do that? But then I realized that 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 very same energy, that very same restless energy or that sometimes inability to accept things the way they are uh, or what, or to push back, to be a contrarian every now and then, while, yes, it's made me stumble a lot of times, that's also been the exact same en energy that has powered my greatest passions uh, and my greatest successes, you know, it, just casting off the social expectations of what if, what if, what if, and doing it anyway, that's how the TED Talk happened. So, you know, it, it's it's a mixed bag, but I think you can choose which side of that equation you focus on, right? The the good stuff or the unhelpful stuff. And especially for people in, in public life, or even if you've only ever done one public thing, you know, uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that there's probably 10 or 100 failures that went on before that. People only see the top points uh, of the mountain. They don't see all the journey that it takes to get there. So, you know, I, I think people need that kind of grit just to be able to, to grind it out sometimes. Not every day is going to be at the top of the mountain, the greatest successes. But when you put in the work and you get scrappy and, and um, you don't stay down when, when you get hit down and you will, uh, then that's what leads to these great successes. And that's how you build resilience. Hmm. I, I want to riff with you really quick about this because like, do you think that, you know, within Western culture, for instance, that the, I mean, you were talking about like putting on a face and, and also, you know, filtering out like some of the bad things in your life. So I think like that is kind of the example. I mean, you can even think about it in terms of like uh, the social media hmm. outlets, right? And then people are constantly just putting like... Yeah, you don't see social media um, photo albums about people's funerals that they go to. <laughs> they choose, they, they cultivate and curate yeah, the life yeah. that they want you to see. Yeah, exactly. And, and something, there is this uh, quote, and I, I have it right here, from a guest you're talking to on your podcast and said, recovery is not about my life being perfect. It's about being okay when it, mm, when it's not. Absolutely. Yeah. And that really, yeah, that really stood out to me because, and then something else that I was thinking about too, in terms of the societal context, are you familiar with this Japanese saying, Hane and Tatamai? No. So Hane, so this is very much like, you know, speaks about Japanese culture and also, you know, the repression Japanese culture. But I think it's also, it can be tied mm -hmm. to Western ideals as well. But Hane is essentially what we feel on the inside. And Tatamai is the way that we act on the outside. And I think that that, I mean, going back to the idea of like compartmentalization and non-compartmentalization, I mean, it takes a long time to train that muscle to realize certain mm -hmm. things about mm -hmm. yourself, certain truths about yourself, right? And I think sometimes people just want to shy away and bury that thing, that trauma into their subconscious. And I don't know. I mean, I think that's the challenge is mm -hmm. like... I think it is. And I can distinctly remember 
um, especially as an ado adolescent, but really well through my 20s and, and you know, my young adulthood, um, having this distinct feeling uh, that that the casing that I was in was different uh, from what was inside the casing. In other words, the, that I wasn't really being my full self, that I felt like I had this whole inner world um, inside me. Uh, and it didn't match up uh, with the thing that was on the outside. I, I felt that, I think, for, for much of my life. Um, and I think we need to to challenge that. I mean, if, if that is the case, if we are feeling that way, um, what what do we need to put in place to be more of our true selves? Or recognizing as well, and I think this is an important part of it too, maybe that's okay. Maybe it's okay that you don't know who you are yet, um, that you're still forming that and you're still gathering the data and, and the you know, the maturation process will happen later. I think a lot of people, you know, I've even talked to, to 10 year olds that say, no, no, I'm mature. Right. But let's give it some time for stuff to come together because we know that the brain is still developing into your 30s, that we have this idea that kids turn 18 years old or 21 years old or whatever, and all of a sudden they're a different person. They're an adult. Well, no, we're still growing up uh, much further into our perceived adulthood uh, than people realize. And actually, because of the way that life changes, some people grow up uh, again uh, later on in life, and that's okay too. We shift our identity. Uh, I think we have to, because we we I think sometimes we'll stagnate uh, if we don't keep it keep it interesting and and keep redefining ourselves in such a way. Um, there's no pressure to settle yourself down into anything uh, until you're ready to do so, and you and you find what's right for you. So I think that's partly where that that disparity comes from my concern however is that if it's if it's if that disparity inside you between who you think you are who you feel you are and how you present yourself if that stays in place for too long uh, or if it becomes uh, too stark of a difference that's where you almost see a splitting off where you you divorce yourself from your from your so if you call it your soul or your inner self or your mind or your conscience or whatever um, that's mm. where you see these splits start to happen and i think that that causes people a, a significant amount of mental health uh, challenges as well when they feel so divorced from the person that they uh, truly want to be. Definitely. Yeah. Do you think that there's maybe a um, toxic productivity outlook or maybe certain expectations that we have within our Western culture that I mean, especially with technology and everything, sure. and there's so many different productivity apps, and you know, a lot of talks within yes. the zeitgeist. So. Yeah, yeah, always be better and bigger and faster, and and yes, absolutely, we're surrounded by that every day. Um, we live and and work uh, often in extremely. Um, regimented societies where creative types aren't generally seen as all that productive, despite the fact that society couldn't function uh, without the product uh, that creative types create. Uh, so I think in that is a is a is a paradox. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm victim to this, too. It's actually one of my areas where I work on myself the most even to this day of feeling guilty because I didn't answer, you know, I, I didn't reach inbox zero yet. I don't think I ever have in my entire life uh, fully answered every email. Sometimes I don't answer them for months and I carry that guilt and then still wake up in the next morning and don't answer the email. So I think that's still something that I struggle with is that self-judgment. And we, we try our best, of course, from a, you know, a, a cognitive behavioral therapy perspective to chunk out the work and do what's necessary and um, uh, rank the work according to what I need to do and what I don't. But also, we also need to learn how to have boundaries too. that, that uh, we do as much as we can uh, with the skills and the tools and the and the presence of mind that we have today. And so at some point, we have to say to ourselves, you know, that's good enough. Uh, that That's OK. I, I am who I am. I did what I did. Um, maybe I didn't try as hard as I could have today, mm -hmm. but I can try that tomorrow if I really if I really feel passionate about it. Um, I think that's that needs to be, the, to be the approach that we take, not setting ourselves up against some unrealistic uh, standard of what other people think we should be. You know, I think we do this to kids all the time. They have to be the greatest sports hero ever. They have to be the best in school. They have to get into the best, absolute best kindergarten because that will decide their, their life for the rest of their life. Well, actually, nobody's going to remember what kindergarten you went to or elementary <laughs> or high school or probably university. If you went to Harvard, not many people care in the real world, it turns out. So, you know, I, I think that, that we need to put these in, things in perspective and realize that other people will never stop 
projecting their stuff onto you, their expectations of who they want you to be. But eventually you come to a point where you get to realize, oh, I actually get to decide that myself, that nobody else gets to decide who I am, that I can choose that and I can shape myself and I can change myself uh, if I want to. Uh, I can settle down into who I am now because it's comfortable as well. Mm. You know, I, I think I, I really learned that through the book writing process as well. And and yeah. not so much the the uh, first draft, you know, the, for the first draft, I went away to a Trappist monastery in the woods and I lived there for a couple of weeks writing, you know, eight to 10 hours a day, every single day, because I really needed to live with the story and go deep into into Dante's Inferno <laughs> to, to really unpack it. Um, but then later, it was through the editing process that I had some of my most profound revelations, which was that, oh, I, these, these are all just events that happened to me. They had a, an implicit meaning, I think, in my unconscious all these years, but they didn't have to. I can actually edit my story and decide what it means and decide where the through line is and decide what I want the conclusion to be. And nobody else uh, can can do that for me. You know, the, the writer Anne Lamont uh, is famous for having said, uh, you own everything that happened to you. Uh, so and you do once it enters your mind, that's your material. So yeah, as you wish. Yeah. Can you speak about that? cognitive reframing that occurred while you were able to write your book and you know you said that mm -hmm. it's you know it was an emotional time for you to you know do the first draft but then being able to reflect on those things and cognitively re reframe it in your mind as maybe a positive experience and things that you could learn from can you talk about that well you know i think that that you kind of hear this on a surface level sometimes about wouldn't it be nice if you could just have a growth mindset or choose to have a growth mindset about these things wherein um, challenges are lessons or opportunities instead of things that mm -hmm. instead of barriers um, or you get to, to reframe your story. And I think for me, it's not the type of thing for me that I was able to force that I had to I went in to writing the book, the first draft with a very specific process in mind. I was going to go in. I was going to write it in a linear um, uh, timeline kind of way, just get all of the information out on page. That's why I pulled all my medical records, all my school records. I literally um, uh, just wanted to take it day by day and get everything out onto the page and then fiddle with it later, find the story later. And I'm so glad that I did that because it allowed me to mine all of the uh, source information. Uh, and then I realized, too, that there was stuff that I had long since forgotten. You know, I thought that I was enlightened and I thought that I was well-rounded and all that stuff before. It turns out half my story I didn't even I wasn't even able to access on a daily basis until I really started to to dig into it. And, and memories, it turns out, memories are sticky. You pull out one and then it pulls out another and then a whole bunch after that. And what was really cool was that I found that 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 certainly happened with my traumatic memories. You know, I would think of one thing and it would lead to something else and something else and something else. And then very often something really hurtful at the end. But it was cool that it also happened with really, with really positive memories, too. I would think of something that, that I really enjoyed or something that made me happy or something else. And I could draw the connections or all the sticky memories that that, that one happy memory dragged out, too. And then sometimes along that chain, there'd be happy or neutral memories. And then there might be a really negative one. But then there might be a couple of others that stuck to that one, some happy, some not. And I realized, wow, our, our entire memory which therefore our entire identity, because who we are is is the sum total of everything that happened to us, is just a web uh, of all of these junction points uh, where there's some good stuff, sure, there's some bad stuff, great, but you get to choose the path um, that you that you want to travel along that web. Uh, and it was in the editing process that I really realized that I, I think um, most keenly, and and it's something that uh, you know it came with a profound sense of. Uh, relief, a profound sense of, oh, I don't have to chase uh, my self-actualization anymore, that I'm, I'm right, I've been right here all along. <laughs> I, I was looking for myself for all these years and I never left. I was right here. Uh, and I think that once you do the work, however, whether you're a writer or whatever your mm -hmm. process is, um, when you do the work to process those memories properly, um, they don't stay out there forever. I found that after I went through the writing and the editing process, I, they all went back in the filing cabinet in my brain. And some of them I even forgot again because I, it's like I pull, I cracked it open. I pulled them out. I worked on them. I put them at, back in. Uh, and the result was a, was a different cohesive whole. It was a really 
cool experience. I, and I guess the last thing I'll say on that is that you really just have to trust the process. You don't know that you're in it when you're in it. You, like you just you travel the road, you trust the process, whatever your practice is, uh, and then you come out the other side different. It it turns out. <laughs> Are you familiar with the um, Chinese proverb of the villager? No. What is it? So it's essentially there's this villager and there's all these mm-hmm. things that from our perspective could be good or bad so this farmer among the villagers has these different experiences happen to him so for instance his son goes for a walk and breaks his ankle and all the villagers around him say oh isn't that isn't that really bad you have really bad luck and he says perhaps and then all of the the you know the the whole village has to go to war and his mm-hmm. son doesn't have to go to war because he broke his ankle and then all the villagers around him say oh well you mm-hmm. have really good luck and he says perhaps and then so there's other series of events that happen to him and from the villagers perspective mm-hmm. you know they think like oh they associate these occurrences with something right with either being good or bad Mm -hmm. but the laws of nature are so random and sporadic that we just have to kind of be objective with things and to just you know like who knows maybe a bad occurrence that we thought was bad at that point happened to us but it was actually good because for you for instance it took you down this trajectory Mm -hmm. of self-discovery that you can share with the world, yeah. you know, and inspire people to change their lives. So I think sometimes it behooves us to really understand that these things will happen, you know, and, and it goes back to the grit, you know, being a, being conscious enough to be like, no, I can mm-hmm. sh- survive this. And I'm, I am capable of being able to pull myself out of that thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, as you're, as you were mentioning that, that, um, uh, parable. I did remember uh, some of it. I have heard that before, and I love it because it really speaks to this idea of being able to take a step back. And that's really what it means, I think, to have a, a core identity or to be self-actualized, is that there's a you inside of you that isn't lost in the waves of everything around you, you know, that that you're not one with with everything and you're just yeah. sucked out into the ocean here of, of society, you can take a step back and say, oh, that's a cool wave. I want to ride that one. Or no, maybe not that one. That's not for me. Uh, you get to pick that. And I think that when you can get to that kind of place, and don't get me wrong, it's it's wonderful to lose yourself every now and then in things. I think we need those little brain vacations. Uh, but to come back out of it, too, and, and realize that you're the one who's in control, that you can't control everything that happens to you, of course. You can't control the universe, um, but you can control how you react to it. And um, and and, uh, and which journeys, which trips you want to take along the way. And, and being secure in that, too, I think, is is a key. One of the things that I think prevents people from that sometimes is just their own mind, that they haven't yet, I guess, gotten, gotten the, the training or the mastery uh, over their own mind. Not, not that we can ever master our own mind, I think, but there are skills that we can learn along the way that make it easier. And, you know, I talk to people all the time who are really, really suffering uh, with depression or anxiety or whatever it is. And they feel that they, I felt this way too, that they have tried everything. You hear that all the time. I've tried everything. But if you actually unpack a little bit, okay, let's talk about what you tried. Well, I tried this medication. Okay. It didn't work. Okay. And then I tried a second medication. All right. What else have you tried? Well, that's it. Well, then you haven't tried everything (laughs) because there are so many things to try. But I think it's so easy to get collapsed into that tight little place, especially as you get tired. Uh, And this is what happens when you're at the bottom of that pit, too. You get get so focused in on the struggle uh, that, that you don't realize that there are so many other ways out. So that's why I tell people, even if you don't know if something's going to work for you to snap you out of whatever haze you're currently in, try it anyway. If it doesn't work, try something else. But do you think that's also um, maybe a symptom of our society as well? 100%, I think it is. And and that's why I, I think the mental health awareness movement in some ways has been unhelpful. I think it's it's largely been good that more people are aware, but there's also still, or we've returned to, I should say, a predominant biomedical model uh, wherein we will find a cure for depression. 
Uh, and then some people will say, well, there is no cure for depression and that's tragic. I don't think either of those things are true. Uh, depression is such a multifaceted uh, condition uh, that, of course, you can see it in your brain. You can see everything in your brain. You can't see anything that doesn't go through your brain. That's how the brain works. Um, but it also manifests and comes uh, from a number of different, a number of other different areas of your life, too. Um, so when people are seeking a cure for depression as though it's a, a pill yet to be discovered or um, some sort of, of uh, brain procedure, that's probably not going to happen. Uh, that does, and that's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean that depression is incurable, uh, like, like stage four, certain forms of stage four cancer, for example. It just means we're approaching the cure in the wrong way. That recovery isn't about cure. Recovery is about becoming somebody different on the other side and liking who you are and using your experience for the better. It's not about solving the problem. I think that's a, um, that's why we haven't moved the needle on mental health awareness for so long, because we've been so hyper focused on uh, uh, we've been so hyper focused in a problem focused kind of way. We need to solve this problem of bad feelings. Good luck with that. That's not going to happen. That's not how it works. Mm. What sort of things from your perspective and your research do you think need to change within the system of I guess, yeah, the systems that are in place to help mental health. Well, there's a few things here. I think that, um, y you know, people are now starting to realize, and this has been a good, a very good um, piece of the mental health movement over just the last 10 years or so, is that more people are aware than ever before. We know from surveys that uh, millennials, Gen Z and younger uh, are more likely than any prior generation to both recognize that their mental health might be failing and to reach out for help. That's a good thing. The whole goal of awareness is increasing help-seeking behavior. However, what people are finding out when they reach out for help is that there's not always someone there to reach back, or the person who does reach back isn't the person that they need. Uh, so the people are starting to find out what we've known in other parts of the movement for a long time is that not only is the mental health system broken, the mental health system was never built right to begin with. <laughs> so people are, are going to... Uh, here in Canada, for example, and this is largely true in the United States as well, uh, we're trying to send everybody down the same narrow hallway of psychiatry to fix every mental ache and pain. And then we wonder why wait times are so long or why it's so expensive or why it's not working, why suicide rates aren't uh, meaningfully declining, uh, why why depression and anxiety is still so much worse uh, than it was before, not, let alone with the pandemic. So I, I think yeah. that we need to fundamentally rebuild the mental health care system. The formal mental health care system absolutely has a role to play in people's recovery, especially for certain types of uh, mental illnesses. Not all mental illnesses are created the same. I think that's another pet peeve of mine when people refer to mental illness in the singular as though it was just one big blob of, of the quote unquote, the mentally ill, uh, like we're all the same. Uh, when there are hundreds of different manifestations, you could show me 10 different people all with the totally. exact same diagnosis of major depressive disorder, and they're going to show me 10 different ways to be depressed. That's the nature of these illnesses. They are different uh, than many other illnesses. So I, I think then that we need to rebuild the mental health care system to better appreciate that, wherein access to evidence-based psychotherapy uh, should be just as easily uh, uh, obtained as access to medication, because we know that medication works for some people. It doesn't work for some people. Um, psychotherapy works just as well, sometimes even better for some people. And for an even greater number of people, when you do both together, it increases the likelihood of success uh, more so than doing either treatment modality separately. But that's not how the mental health system is is currently constructed. It's not really an evidence-based system at all. It's based on, you, you know, you go to your family doctor, they just happen to prescribe one of the top three to five most common antidepressants, and then we set it and forget it and see what happens. It's a very uh, imprecise uh, system, and it doesn't have to be that way. So that's where I think we need to do the most work right now is creating uh, both a more holistic mental health care system that includes uh, medical interventions as well as psychotherapeutic and social interventions, um, and and uh, also does so with with an evidence base as well. It's not enough to send somebody to some. You know, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of public access to psychotherapy, but not all psychotherapies and psychotherapists are the same. They're not all created equal either. So there needs to be quality control. There needs to be an evidence base. Uh, and fortunately, we already have a lot of that on the social supports and on the psychological support side. So that's where I'd like to see uh, the next phase of mental health uh, awareness and practice going is to really implement the strategies that actually work to help people recover. Yeah, I like that. 
Well, I'll ask one more question, but I generally ask a question about advice to artists and creatives, but I want to speak more specifically about your expertise and area of study. So what advice would you give to people that in general that are struggling with depression, anxiety, and those sort of things that can impede on people's um, positive mental health? Yeah. And I mean, just to preface this, I would now, I think, and have for the last several years, consider myself much more so an artist and creative than uh, than not. Uh, and I never would have thought that before, but um, it very much is the case. What do you think, Jane? Um, forcing myself to be an artist and creative, creating a book, I think, and writing and becoming a writer. And I bought the sweater. I bought the computer. I, I did it all. And, and it really helped to um, unlock that in yeah. me. And I think that's actually in many ways um, what helped me bring together those two disparate parts in me, that difference between how I felt inside and what I was trying to be on the outside. When I realized, oh, no, there's there's a really cool creative core mm. in here that I'd been rejecting uh, for all my life. And once I leaned into it, once I ran toward it, oh, I'm a writer. That's really cool. I didn't know that. <laughs> it was a really a profound revelation. But I, I'll also say that I think mm. this ties into your question, too, around how we can maintain our mental health as creatives uh -huh. uh, and realizing that everything you encounter is material, that you might not know what it is yet or what it's for yet, um, what it's there to teach you or what you're going to do with it. But everything that you accumulate in your life, every grief, uh, every every anguish, uh, I think can be uh, not only motivation, but it can be incredibly powerful uh, extraordinarily raw material and everything that I've ever done that's been successful has come from that really emotional raw place. Like I, I would be writing something um, just kind of impulsively and I'd make myself cry and then I'd come back, I'd send it to my editor and they say, wow, that's really good. Where did that come from? And then I'd send them something else that I've been agonizing over for three days or five days or whatever, just trying to get every word right. And they're like, nah, do it again. This doesn't work. So I think that stuff that just generates from, from the, the, whatever it is inside you and, and yeah. only I think creatives know what that really is. Um, it's incredible material. And from a clinical perspective, from a mental health perspective, why I think that's so useful is it helps you to take that step back that we were talking about before, uh, to realize that when an adversity comes, when a strong emotion comes, that it doesn't have to be your enemy, uh, that it can actually be your friend. Even your dark thoughts uh, can be loved uh, and they can be used. And, and I think that when you, sh that's the very earliest part of that mind shift change where you realize mm. that I can actually do something with this, that I don't have to be a victim. I don't have to be a slave uh, to these emotions, to these feelings, that that I can do something with them. Uh, and I think that that is a, a key component to recovery. Mm. Was there something that you read or like a book? Because like the things that you're talking about, being able to be in control of your emotions, it just reminds me a lot about stoicism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't identify as a stoic uh, myself, but um, but I think there is a lot there. And and I'll say too, when you know, all of my journey um, in undergrad, I was I passionately wanted to study psychology. Uh, it turns out I wasn't meant to be a psychologist because I was also, meanwhile, double majoring in philosophy as well, because I always liked the idea of ideas uh, more so than uh, the practice, big P psychology, as it's called. And I remember feeling uh, so offended when I was I was trying to get into the honors psychology program. And uh, the program director said to me, you know, maybe you're a better fit for social work. And I was so offended by that. Now, with social workers, I've been some of my greatest supports and friends over the years. But it's just not who I thought I wanted to be, right? I wanted to be a, a thinker or a scientist or whatever. And, it, and that's just not who I was inside. Um, so anyway, your, your comment on stoicism triggered that for me, that uh, when you lean into that and, and own your incarnation, whatever that or however that's articulated, I think uh, it's a beautiful thing. Definitely. I agree. Yeah. Well, Hey, Mark, thanks seriously for taking this time. I, I really appreciate you and, and value you for you know, sharing your thoughts on our program. And hopefully we can do it again sometime soon. Thank you. I'd love to. It was fun. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Take care. Music for the podcast is by Rarebit, a.k.a. Justin Dosher Hopkins. Creative producer is Noah Wainwright. YouTube and creative support is by Tyler Scully. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.